Okay, I'm delighted to introduce Eric von Spier from the University of Utrecht. Um, so I put a little thing together. I'm trying to be too long, Eric, but you know he has quite a few accolades at this point. Um, and he does have uh, a link to the University of Miami here. He was a postdoc with myself and Bill Johns quite a few years ago. Um, he did his PhD in Utrecht with uh, Bill Garata. I'm sorry if I'm saying some of the Dutch uh, not correctly. Um, and then he came to the University of Miami to do a postdoc, as I said, with myself and Bill Johns. And then he went to the University of New South Wales to work with Matt England and even got down to the Antarctic ice while he was down there. Um, and continued around the globe uh, back to London in Imperial College where he was an assistant professor and now he finds himself back in Utrecht as an associate professor. Um, Eric's best known for simulating the flow of water parcels around the ocean, so the Lagrangian circulation, and uh, including the dispersion of plastics, which she's going to talk about today. And I also wanted to mention that um, Eric has won a couple of early career awards. He won the EGU Early Career Award, and he also won the AGU McElwain Medal. I was there for your talk. It was, it was very good. And a couple of fun facts um, about Eric. Uh, Eric likes to make his own clothes, although this is not one of them, not. but they are fantastic. Um, and he's vegetarian. So yeah. thank you very much, Eric. It's great to have you there. Well, thank you, Lily. It's great to be here. It's really, really nice to be back and to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces uh, after 11 years um, back in the warmth and uh, I love it here. Uh, this is great. Anyway, so I'm going to talk um, about how stuff moves around in the ocean. You may have seen me talk about that before, but particularly now about large pieces of plastic and how they move around um, and how we do that, how we simulate that. And I want to start with the image here that I deliberately already put up right from the, the, the beginning. Um, it's actually the back cover of a uh, textbook that I wrote together with Bob Marsh, um, Ocean Currents Drivers in a Changing World. Um, and this is a, uh, a map of virtual particles on the ocean. So if you take the surface flow of an ocean model, high resolution, one twelfth degree ocean model, and you put virtual particles in there and just let them move around with that flow, then you get this. And the key thing, what I guess oceanography is about, and especially the Lagrangian oceanography that I am uh, so excited about, is to get patterns out of this, to try and figure out, well, what do we see? What are the patterns that you see from this, what essentially is a, a spaghetti plot of Lagrangian particles moving all around. Now, this is a, uh, a map, a static map. You can also make an animation of this, and that then looks um, Looks like this. So this is a uh, the same simulation actually. We start particles all over the surface of the ocean on a uniform grid and let that affect uh, affect with the flow, and then you get something like this. What you see immediately is that well that the uh, uh, the equatorial regions they clear out. Uh, also on the uh, around the Southern Ocean in the northern uh, North Atlantic, and uh, all these virtual particles which are stuck at the surface in this flow model. Um, they accumulate in the five subtropical basins, in what we now know are the garbage patches. And um, if you've heard me talk about this before, then I've been talking extensively about, well, why is this? Why do you actually get this convergence? It's obviously, of course, a relation between uh, Ekman convergence, geostrophy, combining the two, maybe a bit of Stokes drift. There's a lot to say about this, but really what I want to focus on today is the second order pattern that sits on top of this. So the first order pattern is low concentrations in the southern hemisphere, or the, the southern ocean, high concentrations in the subtropical desires, low concentrations in the, um, in the tropics, high concentrations in subtropical desires, low concentrations again. But what, what, is about, uh, what, what happens on, on smaller scales? What happens on top of this large scale pattern? And one Hint was already uh, a few years ago in a paper where I had a small room collaborating, but this was a, uh, a group um, out of France that did a, uh, a sampling campaign in the, um, in the subtropical gyre of the, of the North Atlantic Ocean. So here you see Florida where we are right now, and this is kind of the outline of what they thought was the, 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 the subtropical gyre, um, where all this plastic accumulates. And they, and they did a cruise from uh, here in Caribbean into that area and back again. 
and they use a manta troll to sample through the ocean uh, for a mile long sampling that in the end just collecting how many pieces of small plastic so the type of plastic that fit within uh, the mesh of a manta troll how many do we find and the key thing that they did was that they then compared that to uh, sea, uh, sea level anomalies so they sampled one cyclonic eddy and one anticyclonic eddy um, and quite simple then is to analyze well is there more plastic in the cyclonic eddy versus the anticyclonic eddy and indeed, we found in this paper uh, that there was much more plastic in the high uh, sea level anomaly uh, samples than in the low sea level anomaly samples. Of course, this is an NS1 study, right? One anticyclone, one cyclone, but it already hints that there is more to this question about where all this plastic in the ocean is than just the large scale uh, subtropical gyres. And in fact, if you look a bit more careful and you collect all of the samples that have ever been taken with these kind of mentor trolls, then you get this picture. Zoom in again of the, uh, the, the Western Tropical Atlantic. And what you see, and this is a data set by Cara uh, Lavender Law out of uh, the Sea, sea Education Association in Moose Hall. Um, and what you see is, well, that if you squint your eyes, sure, you see more yellowish colors over here where you have the, uh, the subtropical gyre. But in fact, there's much more variability on the smaller scale than there's a pattern on the larger scale. I hope you agree with that. You could easily find uh, two uh, very close together samples that are two, three orders of magnitude difference in the amount of plastic that is found. And these are even, I mean, that's of course not seen in this, in, in this map, but um, those could even be just a few days apart. So the situation is much more spatially heterogeneous and temporarily heterogeneous than you, what you would think from simple Ackman uh, theory and geostrophic theory. There's much more to it, much more of this, um, this interaction. And that's what I am now very interested in, and I hope, and I guess a lot of you here um, at the Rosenskill school, school too, is this interaction between the large-scale flow patterns and the much smaller-scale flow patterns. And um, a few years ago, I led a, a large review article um, out of a, a score working group on the on the, 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 the processes that control the um, uh, the transport of floating material. And what what we came up with was a whole list of different processes, from indeed the large-scale processes to the sub scale processes, stoke shift, internal tides, direct wind transport, land uh, uh, circulation, vertical mixing, ice formation, maybe even rivers, all of the coastal processes, which are even more complicated to, 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 to represent the models, um, extreme events, which of course are uh, infrequent, but may have an important impact, and maybe even something like transport by, by biology. And what we came up with is, well, if you really want to understand how plastic accumulates and how it transports in the ocean, then you really have to come up with a framework that captures all of this. And it's a challenge. Because if you look at this in the typical uh, space-time diagrams that we've seen before, then here's the typical length scale of all of these processes. Here's the typical time scale of all of these processes. And what you see is that this, this gray, uh, green area is now what is resolved by typical high high resolution ocean simulations. Say, um, the submissive scale eddies, some of the geostrophic currents, of course, wind driven gyres. Uh, the slope currents are reasonably well, uh, well, well covered. The residual tidal currents can be uh, in, in, in incorporated now. But all these other processes out here can't be um, are not yet incorporated, at least, within those, uh, those, those large-scale global ocean models, because in the end, this is a global problem, and we do want to understand the transport of, of, of plastic on a global scale. Now, my proposition is that rather than trying to make this box just bigger and bigger and bigger by, by, by shifting um, this corner in this direction, it might be much more feasible to put some of the uh, processes, the physics of those processes, on the particles themselves. So rather than having the particles just interpolate physical fields, you do the, part you do the physics on the particles. You encode 
what we know about how longer circulation works in the Lagrangian framework directly. Um, we've done that already for, say, uh, uh, the barotropic tides. We know how to do this. And uh, this figure actually comes from a, a, a grant proposal that was submitted over summer where I'm proposing to also do all these other processes in the same way. And, um, well, if the funders uh, are, are, are so inclined, then who knows, maybe in five years I'll be back here to say that, ta we've done this. Um, but this is kind of like a, a forward look of where I hope that, um, that you can really start to combine Eulerian and Lagrangian particles in one framework and get the, the best of both, essentially. That, of course, then also means that you have to validate it. That means drifter experiments. And we've talked already on Tuesday extensively about this. Like, how would you then, for all these processes, start to do experiments so that you can actually validate the physics that then goes into the model um, to get into uh, the, the, the prediction of, um, of these, these accumulation events uh, on, on scales from, from centimeters to, to kilometers. Now, so that is. The first part is essentially what I wanted to say. The second part is then, okay, so why? Why would you need to know where all this plastic is? Why is it so important? Why am I, after 10 years, am I still working on models to predict the transport and the accumulation and the immersion of hotspots of plastic? I think it is because, well, we do want to do something about this plastic, right? It is something that is uh, a sore to the eye, it is something that's an atrocity. Uh, it's also an opportunity to learn more about the ocean, I'll come back to that. Um, but the more and more I've started to think about it, I, I, I realize that the, the most interesting physics is actually in the largest plastics. Forget about microplastics, forget about nanoplastics. Let's go back to entire bottles. Let's try and do this framework for macroplastics, particles that are larger than five centimeters or so, where you can really trace them through the ocean. And the reason why that is relevant to do is that it's really only those large pieces of plastic that we can ever hope to get out of the ocean again. The small pieces of plastic, they're so small, you can kind of forget that we can ever extract them in some way from the ocean. Um, but really, most of the mass of, um, of, 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 micro pla of, of plastic is actually in the macro size. 95% uh, or so of all the mass of plastic is in items that are larger than 5 centimeters. They're not the most abundant, um, but the mass for sure is that. Now, then where do we actually need to clean them up? Um, there, most marine plastic actually originates from land. Most, uh, and there's a paper that shows very nicely that actually most of the uh, of, of, of the um, of the plastic that we find in the ocean, especially in the coastal oceans, comes actually from land. Um, most of the microplastic actually stays in the coastal zone for a very long time. It kind of goes back and forth between the coastal zone, the ocean goes flip flops this coast ocean coast pathways. We think, and I still don't really understand why, but we we found in a series of paper that more than half of all the plastic that ever enters the ocean never gets further than 500 kilometers offshore. It constantly stays in that coastal zone. Um, now, most of the fragmentation of plastic from uh, large size particles into microplastics and nanoplastics also happens on coastlines. It's there where entire bottles scrape into microplastics, where bags tear into smaller plastics. Not so much in the open ocean, that really happens on the coastlines itself. So that means that if you ever want to do something about the plastic problem in the ocean, then the coastlines are in some ways the best place to do that. The plastic is still large when it is in the co on, on the coastlines, and if we take it out there before it fragments into microplastic, then we've also prevented um, a lot of generation of microplastic that then wash into the open ocean. And finally, as a sixth point about why I think it's a good idea, if you ever wanted to do something about plastic in the ocean, to do that on coastlines, is that actually beach cleanup is good for your mental health. There's a great paper by uh, a group uh, by Kelly Wiles at the uh, University of Exeter who showed, so she's an environmental psychologist, and she showed that if you ever go for a beach walk, um, that the, the mental health benefits, you, you do get mental health benefits of going for a beach walk, 
but the mental health benefits are even larger if you also take out the trash that you see along the way. Uh, so there you go, right? This is a great, great deal. You go for a beach walk, you clean the beach, and you actually get a, um, a mental health benefit out of it. So the solution is quite simple in my mind, is that if you want to understand, if you want to do anything about plastic in the ocean, then start on the beach, clean it up there. Um, but the question is then, well, where? Where on the beach? Should we just go anywhere on the beach? Should we just every plastic that you found? Or is there a better strategy? Can we somehow target when and where to best clean up the plastic? And that is a, um, a question that we posed in a paper that was, was published a few months ago in, a, in, a, in the Ocean Science Journal, where uh, Mikael Kandor, uh, 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 he was a, a PhD student in my group. He just, he's about to graduate now. He has a postdoc uh, somewhere in Germany on data simulation. But he looked at uh, whether we could train a machine learning code, uh, uh, a random for forest model to predict when and where plastic would wash up on the Dutch coastlines. Uh, and we chose the Dutch coastlines because we had a really good data set from uh, our collaboration partner, Stichting in the North Sea, and they, for, for uh, six years in a row, had been doing beach cleanups on the entire Dutch coastline, if you don't recognize it over here. Um, and every point on that coastline, they, uh, they cleaned completely and they weighed how much plastic had it been taken off the, uh, off the coastline. And because we've got so many uh, spatial reg resolution as well, so we had six years, so we had a bit of the temporal variation, uh, Miko was able to put this into a, a random forest model and to try and find out, tease out, well, which are the, are the, the, the features, the processes that best predict whether and when plastic washes ashore. That worked reasonably well. I mean, it's not the best model that we ever could create. I mean, it's the best that we tried. Uh, but what you see here is that, so this is the, uh, the observed value for all the, all the, 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 the data points, and this is the predicted value for these same data points. And see that we've got a, a reasonable correlation of 0.7 or so. It's not a great model, uh, but the thing is that the internal variability of the data set itself, which is set by the red lines here, so the, 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 the area between the red lines is uh, two times the standard deviation of the, of the internal variograms. So this is something about essentially the internal variability of the data set. That is already pretty large. So we did have a very large variability, essentially uncertainty, if you want, in the data set itself. On top of that, we were able to predict some, although you do see that the model, for example, um, under predicts the high values and over predicts the low values. So it can't really get those extremes, this extreme variation in the amount of plastic found. And all this, of course, on a log scale. But what's more interesting, I guess, is not so much how much plastic has, um, has ended up on the beach, but why that plastic then ends up on the beach. And because this was a random forest model, um, uh, Mika was able to really tease out which of the predictors that he put in, he put in something, a few dozen predictors or so, which of those were the most important in terms of their Gini uh, importance co 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 coefficient, which ones were the most important to actually say something to predict whether and where plastic would, uh, would rush ashore. And the thing here is that all of the blue ones have to do something with the tides. So really it was the tides, the standard deviation of the last 30 days, so the variability of the last 30 days, the uh, maximum tide of the last three days, um, the, uh, the length of the coastline, uh, the maximum tide during the tour, those are important. The red ones had to do something with the currents and the relation between the currents and the, and the, and the coastline, so whether the currents were onshore, uh, their, 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 their inner products. Um, those were a bit important. And what was not very important was actually all of the orange ones, which had to do something with the sources. So where did this plastic actually enter the ocean? And how did it enter the ocean? And that was quite surprising to us, to me, um, because I would have thought, well, you find plastic on a beach if there's plastic in the ocean. That doesn't really seem to be the case. My interpretation of this is, that it's re is really that in the North Sea at least, there's so much, or there's sufficient plastic floating around constantly that whether it beaches or not, it's not so much a function of how much new plastic enters the, uh, the, the North Sea, it's much more a function of the local conditions, the local 
um, wind direction, the local wave direction, the local tides. And the cool thing is the data, of course, are much more predictable. That is what we have met ocean uh, predictions for. So this, so this does give an opportunity to actually start predicting maybe when plastic will wash ashore and where it will be, and therefore help uh, well, uh, managers uh, to actually do something about well, where um, where can we target? When do we need to go out? Where to clean up the plastic? I'll come back to that a little. Bit. But so, but first I want to take a bit of a side tour and. A, um, a bit of a spin-off work that we did on this was then that we also asked ourselves, well, whose plastic is it actually that then washes ashore? Can we uh, play the blame game? And the way that we're doing that is, is, is asking the question, well, if you find plastic somewhere on the beach, then what can you say about the probability of any source that it came from there? Right? And if you write it like this, then you immediately and think about, well, this, this sounds a bit like a, like a Bayesian formulation. There's something Bayesian about this, right? Which indeed it is. You can write this as the probability that uh, the plastic um, uh, comes from source S, given that you find it at a certain location X. That is what we want to know. And this can rewrite in this uh, alternative form here, the, the, the probability that it um, uh, is at location X, given that it came from source S times the probability that it came from source S in the first place, divided by the probability that it is at location S, uh, at location X to begin with. Right? Now, these three terms, we can do something about. The first one, PX given S, that is the likelihood, and that is literally what comes out of Lagrangian simulations. Right? You start particles somewhere, so you define a source, and you track how they move through the ocean. So this is what uh, Lagrangian particle simulations uh, can give us. P of S, that's the probability that plastic comes from a certain source. And there are huge, like many, many groups around the world that are now compiling data sets of plastic sources into the ocean. Whether it's from rivers, whether it's from uh, fisheries, whether it's from coastlines, all of these sources are out there in terms of, of atlases. Um, the trickiest bit actually was the, uh, the denominator here, P of X. Because what this essentially means is that the probability that if you go to a certain location that you would find plastic. And that of course depends on all of the sources everywhere. So in what we would call the, the open framing of this question, you would need to know the, 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 the transport of plastic from every possible source in the ocean. Now, that's still a little bit beyond scope for what we're doing. So what we've done so far, and this actually was, was, was formalized by, uh, by Claudio Pierrard, who's a PhD student in my group uh, from Mexico. Um, what, we, what we instead did is that we formulated what we call the closed version of this problem, where we say, well, we're only considering a finite number of sources. Uh, and if you then have those finite number of sources, then essentially you're asking the question, if I find a piece of plastic, what's the probability that it came from any of those n sources? And if you do that, then this just becomes a, uh, a normalizing term. Other way to look at it is that this is just so that the sum over all sources then just becomes one, right? So that the probability that it came from any of the sources is one. That's a way to, uh, to rephrase this. Now this is uh, the mathematical uh, formulation. You can also do this more Picturally, and this was what uh, Bram van Duin, he was a, a bachelor student in my group. What he did, he looked at, as I said, one of the places in the south of the Netherlands, you probably don't recognize the coastline here unless you've, stopped, or you've been to the Dutch coastline at some point. It's beautiful here, it's nice, it's a tourist area. And he asked himself, if you find a piece of plastic right here in this area, where could it have come from? So, what's the probability that um, if you find it on a beach at a certain time where it has beached, that it comes? from a certain source at the time that it was reached. Right? Um, and he did that with a backward simulation to calculate what's the probability that it is beached at the time that it's beached, that it comes from a certain source at another time, and then the overlay essentially with a probability that plastic is put into the ocean from a certain source at that same time. And it's that convolution that you can then calculate. Uh, this can find out. And this is what that looks like. So this is where he did it from this, this, this yellow, this big yellow dot over here. The, 
that's his, uh, his source location. And as a function of time, you can now calculate that if you would find a piece of plastic at that location, what the probability is that it came from one of the fishing sources in blue, one of the rivers outflow in, uh, in, in I see the, the, the gray circles, or one of the coastlines in red. Right. So now you can really, as a function of time, figure out, okay, where does this plastic actually come from? How, um, well, who, who can we blame for plastic that you find in the ocean? Except for that there's one big unknown still. You can kind of see it here already. The big problem is that we don't really know if you find a piece of plastic in the ocean, how long it has been in the ocean, how old, how long has it traveled through the ocean. And that's also what Bram found, and that's in this figure. Because here you see what is the likely probability of the different sources. Over here is the colors, uh, with, with the Netherlands in orange, of course. Um, and all of the dashed are, are, the, are the fisheries areas, the non-dashed are the, the, the non-fishery sources. And what you see is that if the plastic would have been in the water for only a few weeks, the most likely is that it would have come from Dutch fisheries or Dutch coastline, as you would expect. As the plastic would have traveled, that had more tra time in the ocean, the probability that it came from another source changed. And especially for longer than a year or so, the, the biggest probability is that it came somewhere from the east coast of the UK, essentially from London. Um, but if you now want to put this up in court, right? If you, then, then you've got one giant variable here, one uncertainty in, in your analysis. How old is this plastic? How long has it been in the water? And that is well, what I've been scratching my head for, for, for a year now around. I mean, how do we get there? How do we find this out? I don't think we can do it from the physical oceanography alone. We need to work together, right? It's something uh, analyzing the, 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 the piece of plastic themselves, the, the chemical de uh, de degradation of them. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm working together with a group of archaeologists from the University of York in the UK who look at um, a piece of plastic that we find on beaches as if they were artifacts. And, I mean, that's what an archaeologist do does. An archaeologist digs up something, an object, and tries and, 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 and find a story, the, 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 the history of that object, that artifact. You can only, uh, and um, uh, John Schofield, who's, who's the leader of the Benedict Project, argues that you can also do that for contemporary items, for pieces of plastic, trying to find out based on labeling, based on many, many other things, where does this come from? What's the story? And the, um, my favorite story about this is actually that. Um, they and, and, and other collaborators of me were at some point doing this in Svalbard. So Svalbard, high up in the, nor in the Arctic, uh, north of Norway. Uh, and big um, uh, beach cleanup, all the, uh, all the items that they found on the beach, they collected and they put into a big warehouse and they categorized them, especially the bigger items that you could really recognize still. And there was one category of cosmetic products, shampoo bottles, deodorants, shaving creams and as the group of archaeologists were looking at them someone said hey this is peculiar this is strange all of these cosmetic products are, are male products they're male shampoo bottles and they're male deodorants and of course so this is not because a male shampoo bottle drifts left and a female shampoo bottle drifts right right it's not that's not the story um, I think what is the story is that those probably came from the local fisheries, which are male-dominated professions. Uh, and that is, that then really points, if you can make that very strong, then that is an argument for saying what the source is of those items that are found on the beach. We're very carefully looking at it. Right? And it also suggests that, that they are um, deliberately littered. Because, well, so we have conversations with the fisheries around Svalbard, and they say, well, we're not, we're not littering. Sure, every now and then a piece of plastic might fall overboard. You uh, know, in tough conditions, um, a net breaks loose. We 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 lose a, a glove or a box or so. Sure, that could be, but no one is actually taking a shower on deck in the salt in salt water, right? So how can a shampoo bottle actually get then into the ocean? 
So this really starts to tell the story about, well, where does this come from? Who is to blame? Um, another, another inroad into finding out, well, how long has plastic been in the water, of course, is to look at the, um, at the, at the, at the, at the biofilm that the textures. And trying to figure out, well, what can the biofilm and, and, and uh, both the taxonomy of the, of, of the organisms that are on, are on items, but also um, the, uh, all kinds of, 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 um, of, of, of chemical tracers in the organisms, what can that tell us about where those organisms have lived, how that, the, 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 this item has traveled around. And all of this, as I said, so we've been doing it um, on the Dutch coastline, both because it's nearby, um, also because it's a pretty easy coastline. But really, what we want to do is deploy this in the in the Galapagos re region. So I'm part of a large Galapagos project um, where we've we've we well the, the the pitch is that we want to make the Galapagos the first plastic-free uh, ecosystem in the world again. And if you can't do it in the Galapagos, then where can you ever hope to do it? The Galapagos is on the equator, so it's in an upwelling zone, so there's Diversions of flow at the surface, at least you don't get too much new plastic coming in. Um, although there are, of course, horizontal currents that also go towards it. Um, it's highly regulated, it's iconic. Um, uh, there aren't too many people living there. So in this project, we are working together with the uh, Galapagos Park Rangers to help them predict and manage their own cleanup activities. So manage and, and tell them like where where and when should you go out? And one of the first results that we have, and, and Stephanie Ikma is a, is a postdoc in my group has been doing this, is an anal analysis of actually the connectivity of all the coastlines on the Galapagos Islands and how plastic would flow from one coastline to the other coastline. So of all these you know, the different islands on the Galapagos, she made this connectivity matrix um, that shows that, well, so most of the islands, so most of the plastic stays within its own island. Again, showing that there's this lots kind of like back and forth and back and forth, plastic constantly going, washing out, uh, pushing back in. Uh, but there's also considerable flow between the different islands. And then this connectivity matrix is, is essentially a, a, a network representation of how the different beaches of the island are actually connected to each other. So what Stephanie was able to do is then to use network analysis tools, and here are four of them, to predict, well, if you want to take out the most possible plastic, which are the beaches that you could best target? And of course, this you have to also assume something about the sources of plastic, where it comes from. Uh, but if you assume that that's roughly uniform, then these are uh, the key, uh, key tools, like the betweenness, the source sink uh, tool, the, 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 um, the retention rate. So this helps the park ranges to say something about well, where and which beaches can we best target uh, to actually take plastic out. So that is a super, super quick overview of some of the things that we're doing. And, and I guess that you, pre I hope that you appreciate that this is physical oceanography kind of like for actionable uh, results and a support of um, uh, of stakeholder questions about well, what do we do about plastic. Um, but at the same time, as I said, hopefully we also learn something about how the ocean works. Um, I do now want to take the last 15 minutes or so and take a slightly different angle and tell about my other hat, my other role. Um, I've been last year uh, appointed as a full professor of oceanography and public engagement with the idea that um, that 80% that, that, that of my time I, I keep doing these kind of things, oceanography, lead a team that does research in ocean uh, circulation and connectivity, um, and 20% and of my time work on, well, on, on the public engagement role of climate science, and how do we actually make public engagement more effective in climate science. So the idea is that, um, well, as you know, or, or as hopefully you agree, that, that we can only get out of this climate crisis if there's more climate literacy. If, if, if there's a, a shared knowledge base, a shared understanding, and a shared language even among the public about which to talk about the climate crisis. And because everything is so politicized, maybe the ocean is a nice gateway to start that conversation. 
Um, the ocean, first of all, plays a key role, of course, in climate, as we all know here. But it also lends itself very nicely for public engagement because it is so enigmatic, because it is so romantic, because it is so adventurous, right? Because uh, all of you who have been to sea will realize it. I mean, it's fantastic to be on or in the ocean. And many, many people around the world have that same feeling, um, right? Um, the ocean is also a unique gateway to talk about how local actions actually impact remotely. Think about the plastic, right? We all here, and not only here, but in all of the city, realize that we shouldn't, we should use less plastic in our daily lives. We should stop using plastic straws because we think it has an impact on bloody turtles somewhere out in the, uh, in, in, in the open ocean. And that may or may not be true, um, but the thing is that this perceived impact between what our local actions and the global impact, exactly that, that what is missing for CO2, right? Stop driving your car because the climate will warm. That does exist for plastic. It does exist somehow. It has been generated and we're now, we're now investigating why that really is, why this is such a strong tie and why people so emotionally respond to requests for, for using less plastic. Um, that's something that we're investigating. Um, and the ocean, of course, is a, is a common, so it's a shared responsibility. So that's also another way to talk about, well, what, what, how can we protect the ocean? So this is what I'm going to try, and in particular, um, what I'm, I'm going to do is, uh, in this 20% of my time, is to research actually public engagement, right? With the whole point that everything that we do in the scientific workflow, from um, setting up models, to doing our analysis, to peer reviewing our papers and our publications, that has a protocol. It has been codified. We know what works and what doesn't work. It has in some way been evidence-based. Until we start to communicate about it. The communication that we do about our research is not evidence-based at all. We do it, and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this too, we do it because it feels good. We do it out of intuition. We don't really know what works and what doesn't work. So what I want to do is, I want to answer the question, how can academics in particular, so us here, how can we be most effective in public engagement? Should we even be doing science communication in public engagement? Or is it much better let, left to the uh, professionals? Um, and if it is left to the professionals, then how can we best support those professionals. What is the relation actually between academics and science communication professional, uh, professionals? And how does it work best? Um, what is really the added value of scientists in the public debate? Should we be in a public debate or is it better if we leave it to the vloggers and the influencers? Right. Um, which roles or persona should scientists take? Should we be the heroes? of the story? Should we be the informers? Should we be the villains, maybe? Should we be the warners, right? What, what role? I mean, if you take the stage and immediately you have a role, and which role is actually most effective? Um, one of the other aspects here as well, and then if, 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 if academics are in a public debate, how do we then ex actually define what expertise they have? Not only formally in terms of like what, what what's the formal definition but also how do we as a community oceanographic community in this case how do we actually um, set norms for how we support our peers when they do public engagements right because to be honest if i'm on uh, in the media i'm more worried about what my what my colleagues will say than what my mother will say about my appearance right and we're very often holding each other to very, very high and much far too critical standards. And I'm wondering whether we can do something about that norm, or at least have a discussion about what that norm, that norm is. Um, and the most interesting question, and I want to spend two more than the last two slides on this, is actually, well, is it then actually effective to be activistic? You know, I would, I sometimes want to shout so strongly about the climate crisis that's coming at us, and so much war, and so much be extinction rebellion kind of activistic, 
I mean, I, I had a PhD student at some point who called me up and said that he couldn't come to a meeting because he was arrested. And I said, well done on you, right? It's great. Um, so of course, some of us are activistic. Um, and you can have a whole discussion about whether you should or should not be activistic. That's kind of like an honest broker kind of discussion. I think a more interesting question is actually, is it effective to be activistic? Does it hurt credibility of scientists if they are a a activistic? And that's what a lot of us think, and that's what I would have thought too, right? That be careful not to be too activistic as a scientist because it may actually deteriorate your, uh, your credibility. And so during the sabbatical that I'm on now, really what I'm doing most of the time is reading papers about public engagement, about science communication, about activism. And I've come to quite a few that show that this, this, this fear that we have that, that, um, that activism hurts credibility, that is, may actually not be true. One of the papers that I want to discuss is, is this one. It comes from, uh, uh, from a group um, here in the US who looked at a large US census. And this is uh, 2017, if I'm not, yeah, 2017, so before Trump, everything, uh, just to, to make that clear. But what they asked people is uh, to judge the credibility of a, uh, a press release, well, yeah, or a statement made on Facebook by a climate scientist. And also by a weather uh, broadcaster, but uh, I don't want to go into those. They didn't do details, focus on climate scientists. And that climate scientist um, made all these statements. And then the people were asked, okay, how credible is this climate scientist to you if you read this? And the credibility scale went ran from one to seven. And if that, um, if the, 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 the story on Facebook was purely about a recent finding that this climate scientist had, then the credibility was 5.2. It's on a scale of seven, it's pretty high, right? This is really, I mean, we are credible in a national census uh, analysis. So a thousand people in the US or so. Uh, and then what they did is that they changed that story and they made it more and more activistic. So from purely, this is what we found, to, well, and this means that there are risks and impacts to climate change. The credibility was just the same. No matter, this climate scientist didn't uh, the credibility didn't drop as soon as they started, they started talking about risk and impact. If they talked about policy options and consequences, like how do we deal with this? What can policy actually, uh, what can politicians do to, uh, to, to, to mitigate or to prevent this, uh, this, this recent finding from happening? Credibility was still relatively high. If, 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 if the, the, the climate scientists talked about action, non-specific, but just we need to take action right now, Credibility was actually pretty high at that point. Um, even if they talked about CO2 reduction in the US in 2017, that didn't hurt the credibility. So climate scientists can say, come on, let's reduce CO2. That is um, not detrimental to credibility. Only when the climate scientists talked about nuclear power as a solution, that actually hurt the credibility. Which is interesting. So it says something about that you do have to be careful how far you push out of your expertise. And I think what it says is that nuclear power is not really the expertise anymore of climate science. Uh, so then the credibility dropped a little bit. And another great example of kind of the same point is a study um, out of the ETH in Zurich and uh, also with Naomi Oreskes from uh, Provio University involved. And they did an analysis to ask, well, how much do you expect scientists to be activistic on different, uh, on different aspects of climate science. Um, an interesting thing here is that they asked both scientists and the public. And uh, what you see here on the scale is that if it's left of this bar, they say, no, well, please don't. And if it's right of the bar, they say, yes, strongly agree that, that scientists should be activistic on this point. And for every one of them, the public actually expects more activism. Right? If you take uh, the specific climate-related policies, such as taxes on flights, the public expects us to be activistic on this, to voice our concerns, to say what we think, right? to come out of our ivory tower, if you want to put it that way. Um, and I, my interpretation of this is that we are essentially paid by the taxpayers to be warners. Right? We have 
inside information to the latest and the newest knowledge on climate change. And even in the US, uh, so, so there was also a graph for, the, for, for Germany, I don't show that there, but actually there the scientists agreed much more, um, so they were much closer to what the public said. Uh, but in the US, the scientists seem to be very, very careful on taking activistic points, but, but the public is paying us essentially to do that, and that's their expectation. It's my expectation. And that's what I want to investigate more. So I want to wrap it up, and I want to start again this point, I've now said it twice already, but I do think it's important to, to keep in mind, right? I mean, that the plastic um, that is, 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 is littering in the ocean, I haven't said anything about how harmful it is, I haven't said anything about how, how problematic it is, because we don't know, because I don't think we have enough information about really the harm, the direct harm of that plastic, but it surely isn't a trust. And you should be ashamed that there's no plastic everywhere littering our ocean. Um, but at the same time, it is also an opportunity to learn something about the ocean. It is a unique tracer with different properties from any of the, all the other tracers that we use all the time. And then the three main points that I have. So uh, don't forget about small-scale processes that have a crucial role in the transfer of plastic. The challenge is to capture these processes in numerical simulations. And I propose that to do that on the Lagrangian particles. Then, um, I showed you about the, 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 the numerical models that we have that can be used to optimize bleach cleanup strategies and essentially to play the blame game, maybe even. Um, and finally, I talked about, uh, about public engagement and science communication. And now I think that the ocean plays a unique uh, or, or provides a unique opportunity to have that discussion on a different topic, on a neutral frame, if you want. Um, and the question then that I want to answer in the coming on the rest of my career is how to do that uh, most Thank you. And a question. Yes. Uh, thanks, Eric. It was a really interesting talk. And, um, I, have, I have a couple of questions, I guess, but the first one is more scientific. So, um, I don't know a whole lot about plastic, but I remember somebody presenting and saying that 90%, more than 90% of plastic actually sinks to the bottom of the ocean. So can, is that kind of, presumably that's not 90% of the mass? Is that not, I, I don't know, because you gave a 90% yeah. is within the coastal zone. So I'm just curious about that and how yeah. that comes into you know, or because you haven't really talked about the sinking of the particles. No, haven't at all. Things like no, that. No, no. Well, so, so there was indeed a paper. I was involved from that that showed that maybe 99% of the plastic could have sunk into the seafloor. Then there was another paper that showed with almost the same equations that 99% of all the plastic could have ended on the beaches. <laughs> so the point of it that we don't know. Um, we don't really know where all this plastic is. And that is partly because most of these models work on numbers of particles. The number of particles is really, uh, how many items of plastic are in the ocean? That's a really, really hard number to get. It's the same as asking how many organisms are in the ocean. The biomass is easier to calculate than the organism, the number of organisms. Um, the field is also moving a lot. I mean, if you would have asked me three years ago, I, and, and that's the, the, the keynote I gave the ocean science, I, I said, well, we only know 1% of all the plastic where it is. Um, again, it's a number thing more than a mass thing. Now we've kind of settled on that, and we probably know better where all the plastic is. And I think that, in terms of mass at least, most is floating on the surface of the ocean. Um, I mean, the thing, so about, about the buoyancy, um, still most plastics are either positively buoyant, because they're, they're lighter than seawater, or if they're not positively buoyant, then they are in a shade that still keeps them afloat. Right? That's why drifters work. Um, only when they break down, then they can start to sink. But yeah, this is maybe that's not a complete answer, but it's just trying to figure out. There's so many of these numbers floating around, I agree. But I could give an entire this, uh, talk also about sinking of plastic. We've done some work with Delphine Lobel, who's also been here. Uh, it's important for the attention, I think. Uh, where we did all the sinking of plastic, and we have a paper and a review about 
how the sinking of plastic actually affects the, uh, the carbon flux. Um, if you have biofilm refouling on plastic, then that can actually slow down uh, the carbon plant because uh, so 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 it's carbon that would normally sink like like uh, for your, your, your particular carbon that would normally sink quick. If it has a bit of boiling plastic in it, then it would sink slower. So that can change the carbon plant. This is something that we've been discussing at over beers and conferences for years, um, and every time. We came up on the back of an envelope, we came up, no, it's over 1% um, impact. There's just far more particulate carbon than there's plastic in the ocean, unfortunately. Uh, but now we finally calculated that, and indeed it is a over 5% or so change. So the fact that there's no plastic in the ocean changes the carbon flux by over 5%. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. Another question about that. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions before I take it on? Um, you can yeah. ask people on, uh, online over Zoom if they have any questions. Um, I think my. Yeah, does anybody online have any questions? Where is here? So you go now. Um, yeah, so I was going to ask about the public engagement part. I know we had a we've had a few really interesting discussions while you've been here and um, you know I, I don't disagree that the ocean is you know it's definitely an opportunity for, for engagement and nevertheless right it's it's you know I think one of the reasons maybe why plastic really gets the public imagination is because you know they hold it in their hand they use it every day it's it's very familiar to them um, and they know it's garbage, they throw it away all the time, right? So the rest of the ocean and the, you know, um, yeah. is maybe a little more difficult to engage, um, engage the public with. And you know, one of the things I've often thought over the years and even more lately is that kind of oceanographies have maybe missed a beat in terms of oceanography being in schools, you know, part of geography or a certain, you know, Something yeah. like that, and I know you you've been thinking about this too. So, can you say a little bit about that? How do, how do we how do we get oceanography into into schools? Yeah, for instance. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, I think that it would be very valuable to put it in the geography uh, uh, curriculum. I mean, the, 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 the disadvantage to to us physical oceanographers would be. I mean, I don't know about you, but I so often are called now already a geographer. They get a bit annoyed. They say, no, I'm a physicist. I'm a physicist right? So if you put oceanography in geography, that would be even more. Um, but if you want to tell the story about why the ocean is important and how the ocean links all the land around, right? The, 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 the spillhouse projection, essentially, view of, of the ocean, then um, then putting it in, uh, in geography makes sense. But on the other hand, we also have to realize that this oceanography, of course, is only a very small bar of all of oceanography. Um, and it's probably not the most relevant part to most people. Right? That there is the biological oceanography, that is the fisheries oceanography. Um, that's the, and we shouldn't be worried about that. I think that the, 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 the I'm assuming, I mean, most of the base I know here are the physical oceanographers, so I'm assuming that most of the MPO at least are your physical oceanographers. But, the, my pitch has always been, well, that, that of course, it's a marine ecosystems that matter. And right? if, if the ocean was lifeless, would we actually be worrying about all the plastic that's in the ocean? If there was no life on it, would, would it really matter that much? It is because there's so much life in it that we do worry, we worry about it, that's what I think. But the currents are, of course, the stage in which all this biology takes place. Um, so we shouldn't be overstating the importance of this ocean, but we should help to support our, our, our dear friends in Brothers Ocean and tell that entire story about the role of the ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. Uh, I have a question more on the technical side maybe, or have you ever considered uh, making wave tank experiments? try to class because microplastic can be many things right and with Tamara and Guillaume we did a lot of experiment on Lagrangian uh, drifters yeah and we realized that 
an object in the water has its own behavior. It reminds me of the, the challenges of looking at uh, dispersion of fish larvae. Because yeah. not only they are, there is physical forcing, but they have a behavior, right? So it's almost like they have a behavior. Because they, they might rectify wave, they might more or less windage. And even one, one bottle could, through its life cycle, change behavior uh, depending on, on biofooling, how much water there is in it. Yeah. So are you considering like make, making broad categories of microplastics so you can like tease them out? Yeah, so I, so yes. And actually, so that's also an argument to do it on the particle level, which is equation on the particle, because then you can really follow a bottle as it in the biofounds and changes its, uh, its buoyancy. And the challenge is to come up with the equation. You need an equation that tells how is an object moved given its freeboard, given its shape, given its... Um, that will not be easy, uh, and it will rely maybe indeed on, uh, on a tank experiment. We've done a few, but I'm not really good myself at experimenting. Um, we would love to work together and collaborate and think about, well, how can we tease it out? Um, what I also like is to put uh, trackers in different sizes bottles. Mm -hmm. We discussed this last week already. If you can put a tiny tracker in a small bottle versus a large bottle and really see, well, what, what does that affect that, um, on the flow? Then that is an interesting scientific question. Good points. Very nice talk, really interesting. So there is this guy, I think he has a company, he's a Dutch guy, right? The uh, Ocean Cleanup. Do you work yeah. with them? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> so work is a complicated work here. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, I mean, he's doing, doing this huge ocean exactly. experiment. He wants and also rivers. Also rivers, yes. yes. Exactly. So the story is that, uh, so he wants to put these giant booms in the ocean yeah, yeah. and then clean it all up. I've always been very skeptical of that. Uh -huh. And in fact, at some point, I published a paper that showed that it's extremely inefficient. And if you want to put those, if you, if, you, if you can even get the engineering to work and actually can make those booms that are so large and keep them in a place, etc., then you shouldn't target them to the North Pacific Gyre because that's essentially when, where all the plastic ends up. Yeah. So you, you're putting the horse behind the cart. You should put them instead on coastlines, closer to the source. Yeah. And he's been, he's been doing that. Nowadays, I mean, I still don't fully buy into their claim that they can clean up the ocean. Um, but they are doing very good science. Oh. And uh, one of the posters to my team has been on an expedition with them. Uh, we are collaborating with students. Um, they, uh, all of their, their, I mean, they've got a team of probably 12 or 13 people fully dedicated to scientific studies. All of their uh, publications are open access, or the data is, is fully open, open, uh, open science. I mean, where do they get their funding? They have these huge ships going out and humongous instrumentation. I, I follow them through their YouTube yeah. videos for years. Yeah, yeah. And they even bought some of our drifters mm -hmm. to test yeah. their uh, yeah. little skirt. They uh, they get their funding through a very good sales pitch and a great yeah. team. Yeah, it's a good person to imitate. Sorry, it's a good person to imitate. I mean, right? I mean, if he's, yeah. if he's so rich. Yeah. yeah. Well, he himself isn't rich. Not the rich. I mean, rich in our yeah. research yeah. terms. Yeah, no, the organization is very, very effective. And yeah. I mean, they also put this on the map. They, exactly. they were the first one really to get the story people out. People know, about, people know yes. about that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, outside of academia. Academia, exactly. Yeah. So it right. connects with your yeah. communication. Yeah. And we know each other and we, we follow each other. And, uh, yeah. But we have. Uh, Slightly difficult relationship. Mm. Okay. I won't ask more questions. <laughs> when the camera is on. Yeah. Yeah. Ed, a bit on the the blaming game here. Yeah. So just uh, who is most to blame? Is like the developed countries or developing countries on the amount of trash that is <laughs> is uh, <laughs> is there uh, any? Wow. But uh, no, one consume is more, but yeah. there's more yeah. more capacity to clean it, and the other exactly. can consume less. But uh, well, so if you look at these global more. maps of where plastic enters the ocean, then you see big hotspots in Southeast Asia. That is where uh, all the assumptions are that most plastic enters the ocean. The question is, of course, 
whose plastic is that and what is the system that creates so much plastic entering the ocean there um, and then you get into very difficult discussions about well I mean wh wh why why do we actually have a, a, a waste management system that is so deep my, my point about, I mean here I'm talking about let's clean up beaches but of course that's not the real solution the real solution is just to make a waste management system where plastic doesn't end up in the environment. It's not even the ocean, it's actually the environment where it doesn't be in some ways, right? And it is, I would love to, I sometimes, it's quite controversial, I guess, but I, I sometimes say in the media also that I would love to go back to a situation where I can go into a, a supermarket and get all the plastic bags I want without feeling any kind of moral problem with that. Because I know that that plastic will never, never, ever end up in the environment. That is the situation that we have to go back to. And then we don't need less plastic, per se. We just need a closed um, waste management system. I mean, like in Miami, right? It used to go to China. Yeah. And, and then it was going to Turkey. Because Chinese stopped accepting it. And I don't know where it's going now. Yeah. All and the plastic. And a lot of it is, is incinerated now. Yeah. Or, it's or incinerated, or yeah. 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 In Miami, a lot of it's incinerated. And also Coca-Cola is another thing. They produce 500 million single-use bottles per year. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, with incineration, but also with, with, with bioplastic, and, and the, or biodegradable plastic, and that's interesting that this question hasn't been called here in the US. It's a big discussion in the EU now about what biodegradable actually means. Because if you think about it, biodegradable, even if it would really work, if you can have a plastic bag that completely disappears, it in the end, it, ha it can only disappear in two things, methane or CO2. Those will be the end products. Um, so if there are bacteria that, that eat this plastic, they re respire and then you end up. So essentially, biodegradable plastic is, is, is a way of turning the plastic problem into a climate problem. Uh, we are, we are all gonna die somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's my <fine. laughs> <That's fine. laughs> uh, There was a report that was highlighted by the news uh, like a few weeks ago from Greenpeace, and they were very skeptical about even recycling plastic. They were saying that as we recycle plastic over and over, it's, it's losing its quality and becoming a, a useless product. Yeah. So at one point you have to dump it or burn it, right? Yeah. It's downcycling. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah, this is so so much. I mean, uh, well, we could talk hours yeah, and hours about this. It goes a bit away from the. Uh, but I did realize that actually I forgot to show the last slide, and I do want to show it, and then we wrap up. And that is, of course, that um, the slide that I always show that really clearly says that all what I presented is not only my work, right? It is the work of the team, and I want to put them in front focus here. All the people who've worked with me over the past five years in Utrecht oh um, who, who have done this work, right? And I'm only one of the tiny pieces in this entire puzzle with this diorama of, uh, of fantastic people. Uh, so and they are the people that should work with. And just Thanks. Friday, we'll have student seminars. Um, and thank you. Thanks, Eric.